Good afternoon. My name is Rich Terrapak, and I'm president of the CMC board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. Uh, in case you haven't done so, as Jane indicated, please silence your cell phones, but do whatever you have to do to, to be able to tweet, because we encourage that. The hashtag is CMC Forum, and you can follow us on CMC, you can follow CMC at C Bus Metro Club. For all those who are tech-oriented, I'm not sure what all that means. But anyway, the, um, up for the upcoming events, uh, we've got, uh, this has been a busy week. We had a, a wonderful event yesterday. Uh, and tomorrow, we have uh, the annual Jingle Mingle at, uh, that will be held at the Columbus Museum of Art. Thank you, Ned. From, from 5.30 to 8.30. And uh, we encourage all of the members to, to come and bring guests. Uh, it will be the last event for this year. Jane, I'm glad you're relieved. Uh, it's, just, it's just $35 to attend, and you get to bring three, three guests. There's a heck of an auction, gathered up lots of stuff. You can do some Christmas or holiday shopping. Um, so join us, 5.30 at the museum tomorrow evening. Uh, and you can get the information on our other forums, which will be uh, starting again in January on your program, and they will involve uh, three topics, really, so far. Uh, technology, economic forecasting, and the casino industry should be fun. Uh, take the program with you as a reminder. Post it someplace on the refrigerator or, or next to the coffee pot at the office uh, and encourage others to come along. If you're a guest today, I'd like to invite you to consider membership. Uh, you can sign up at the registration desk, uh, call the office, get online. Uh, when you sign up as a new member, you get the first uh, luncheon free. And it, there's a even a better deal if you come tomorrow night as a guest. Keep that in suspense. Sponsor recognition. Uh, the companies listed on the back of today's program are the folks that support us to the extent of 50% uh, of our annual budget. Uh, and we really appreciate it. If, you, if you're with an organization or firm that would like to be on that uh, August list, please let us know. Uh, let, let Jane or any of the staff members know. Um, today's sponsor. Uh, Good friends, the uh, law firm of Smith and Hale LLC, and it's represented by Jeff Brown today. Uh, today's forum is the annual Harrison S Smith Legacy of Civic Engagement, uh, where we recognize the contributions of Bill Smith made to our Columbus community, which were consider considerable. I want to rep recognize some, uh, some special folks in the audience and good friends. Bill's wife, Connie, son, Jay. <laughs> And his wife, Mary Ann, and other friends of the Smiths who are here. This is also an opportunity uh, to um, have the downtown, downtown Commission uh, present their annual Harrison Smith Award. I'd like to invite Kyle Katz of, the, of Katz Interest to the, uh, to the podium to make this special presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was two years ago on this stage that Bill Smith was interviewed by Keith Myers in a CMC forum titled Harrison Speaks Out. This wonderful discussion was voted by CMC members to be the best forum of 2009. At the conclusion of that forum, the Downtown Commission decided to create an award named for Bill to celebrate his vision, his leadership, and the impact he's had on our commission and in turn the impact he continues to have on downtown Columbus. The Harrison Smith Award celebrates efforts that reflect Bill's desire for bold projects that are well executed and enhance our everyday existence. Projects that raise the bar for the developments that follow, just as Bill raised the bar for us. To present the 2011 Smithies, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Whitman, Chair of the Downtown Commission. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Um, this is a, a great opportunity, uh, yes, to remember uh, Bill, and Bill obviously did a, long, a lot of things to push along um, downtown Columbus and uh, the way we view what we want to have happen uh, in this town. And the interesting thing is today, we had a tough decision to make this year. We had two fabulous projects, and of course the way you solve a dilemma like that is we are giving an award to two recipients today. We've got, 
Yeah, we chickened out to a certain extent. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a great direction to go. It's, you can't say one's better than the other. We have two things that are different. We have a courthouse that is likely to be the last major civic building to be built in this town, at least as far as I can figure, for uh, maybe several decades. Uh, and I think we did it right. I think we did it right across the board. I think it's the right kind of building in the right place. Uh, the setting was done well, the design of it was done well, and I mean done well not just from a Central Ohio Columbus uh, standpoint, but it's going to be a building that we can look at um, or can be looked at across the nation and looked at favorably. Um, and it'll be served, I think it's what I wanted to see, it replaced a building that had been there for 25 years, and I think it will be a 100-year building. And I think that's the kind of level of, uh, of quality uh, that we want to have happen in this town. Another thing we have in this town that we're fortunate enough to have happen, and it came to be here in this year of 2011, is we've had the riverfront for so many years. Well, we've, in a way, replaced that with the Scioto Mile. It's more than just the riverfront. And again, I think we did it right. It's a place that, and it was, the, the, the design of this thing was, was put together in a way that it's a place that people will use across the board. There are places to walk, there are places to sit, there are places to look at the view. Um, there's a wonderful restaurant there. There are fountains for the kids to play in in the summertime. Um, and it's a great thing. And we also built in connections so you can get there from the rest of town and you want to get there. So I, and again, that's the kind of thing that'll be there 100 years from now. So with that, I want to move right on. We have the awards that I would like to do. By the way, I just want to make the point too about both of these projects. They did not get done by one person. They got done by a community effort. It goes across the board. It was the city, it was the county, it was, uh, private individuals. Uh, there are many years of planning to have these things happen. They didn't happen overnight. Everybody kind of got it. Were there, was there push and tug? Absolutely. I think, personally, the, the, the push and the pull and the tugging ended up making it, both of these better products in the end. So with that, uh, let's move on. The Scioto Mile. Uh, the first um, award goes to the Columbus Downtown Development Corp. Is Guy Worley here? Guy, you're way in the back. Got it there? Yep. Okay. And the city of Columbus, Alan. Alan McKnight. Congratulations. Thank you for a wonderful time. Thank you. And again, and again, with so many people involved, um, we have a certificate for MSI Design, Landscape Architectures, Architects and Planners. Darren Meyer, please come up. We've got 360 Architecture. Is Dan Haynes here? And we've got, there he is. Darren, good job. Schooley Caldwell and Associates Architects, Bob Loversich. And HKI Associates Architects. Is anybody here from HKI? Messer Construction. Anyone here from Messer Construction? We'll make sure they get it. Um, now, to move on to the uh, thanks very much. Wonderful effort. <laughs> to move on to the Common Pleas Courthouse, the new Franklin County Courthouse, the Board of Franklin County Commissioners, uh, Marilyn Brown is here today. Please come up. Thank you very much. Architectonica International Corp. Is there someone here from Architectonica? They must have missed the plane. <laughs> Design Group is the architect of record. Jack Hedge? Yay. 
Pizzuti Solutions, Mike Bird. They were the owner's representative. Uh, and here's another one on the list again. Schooley Caldwell Associates, the master planner, Bob Leversage. Can you come back up again, Bob, please? <laughs> Gilbane Building Company, the construction manager, Don Mushlitz. Don, is Don here? Ricky Green, the court's consultant, April Pontiff. So again, it's a great, uh, very broad-based effort. Uh, the results uh, speak for themselves. Thank you very much. By the way, that's a, uh, I, I think the uh, Downtown Commission produced that wonderful um, piece on, on, on Bill, and uh, I direct all of, uh, all of your attention uh, to that piece. Uh, our speaker today is an artist, which is appropriate considering the forum. His sculptures and installations emphasize a dialogue with history and context, particularly in the communities with which he works. Using a variety of media, his work draws from the scale and experience of its surroundings and draws ideas from the broad-based conceptual analysis. His works blur the border between the contemporary and the historical. He is represented by CRG Gallery in New York, where his most recent solo show was Levittown. Please welcome Brian Toll. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Metropolitan Club for inviting me to speak at this event. Lots of friends here in the room. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I've been working in the public realm since 1994. And I have to say that working in public spaces is, in fact, a privilege. Um, I get to travel and meet people around the world, people who are eager to see new ideas expressed through art. I thought perhaps the best way to discuss the value of public art would be through a, a, a personal walk through some of the projects that I've done over the past uh, 17 years. Now I've broken this down into three categories. There are temporary public art projects, and these are projects that are incredibly important. Um, they're sponsored by not-for-profit organizations, museums, um, communities, it allows for artists to present work on a temporary basis at a, at a relatively reasonable cost. So the first project, in fact, that I ever did was a temporary project. It was with a not-for-profit organization called the Public Art Fund. The project was originally uh, constructed in, 2000, I mean, in 1998. It was relocated in 2004. Um, it is the ruin of a colonial house that was preserved by virtue of the fact that it had this peculiar architectural feature, a feature that I call a witch catcher. And I was very happy to have it relocated on the front lawn of City Hall. I can't think of a more appropriate place for a witch catcher to be placed. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to any elected officials in the room. Unlike what it appears to be brick and mortar, this piece is in fact made from styrofoam and a polymer re a reinforced concrete called Drive It. So it's very, very lightweight, it's durable, transportable. A, a more ephemeral project was commissioned by the Whitney Museum of Art for its biennial in 2002. It was located in Central Park. It was the first time that art had been exhibited in Central Park for more than 30 years. The Arts Commission, uh, the, the Central Park Conservancy banned art from Central Park because they believed that art would in fact detract from the artistic beauty of the park itself. Olmsted shared this belief. He believed that his park was a work of art. And of course it is a great construction fabrication, right? He didn't want sculptures littering his park and he 
lobbied against the inclusion of art in his park from the very beginning. So I decided to enter into a dialogue with Mr. Olmsted himself, and rather than put a discrete object in the park as we might expect, I decided to work with nature. And so this iconic bridge, the Bow Bridge, was surrounded by 75 hidden electronically controlled pumps that we could uh, set off at different times in different intervals in different ways. And so if one or two of these splashes were to occur, you might assume that it's a fish or a frog or a stone being thrown into the pond. But when 75 splashes go off simultaneously, you think differently about nature. <laughs> the piece was later exported to England. It was exhibited at the Tate Museum in Liverpool in 2006. Now one of the things you should know about my approach to public art is that I don't have a signature style. I approach each community and each place with new eyes. I don't start out with a specific agenda in mind. And so there is no consistency in terms of how the projects look. If anything, there is a kind of conceptual fingerprint at best that links all the projects together. It's really the way that I approach information, not the way that I express information. This is a project that I did uh, for the Qu uh, Queen's Museum uh, in 2001, it's called Man's Achievement on the Shrinking Globe and Expanding Universe. It was Robert Moses' um, private title for the 1964 World's Fair. Um, it's a far more cynical slogan. Um, anyway, this was a futuristic building designed by Philip Johnson, and for whatever reason, it remained well after the fair was torn down. And so here we're left with a vision of the future that's now in a state of disrepair. And so my proposal was to restore the original lighting plan to the towers. So there are 360 blue lights that have been installed around the rings of a tower. And those white flashes that you see in the center are PC-controlled strobe lights that go off periodically to suggest ghostly tourists visiting the tower. Now, this was very challenging for many reasons. There's no stairwell left in the building. There's no elevator left in the building. So we had to hoist all of our electricians up with cranes in order to reinstall this lighting plan. This is a project that I did in Ghent, Belgium, um, with the curator Jan Hoot. It's called Eureka. And this is a very, very interesting model, a very special public art model. This is a, a case where the entire city of Ghent decided that an exhibition had to be held. And they invited 100 artists to make work throughout the entire city. And these kinds of venues are far more popular and common in Europe than we find in the United States. And I hope that that's a trend that, that changes in the future. Um, one of the things that the curator included in this exhibition was Jan van Eyck's Mystic Lamb, the great altarpiece. And so I was forced to think about painting. And I found the building that's behind the sculpture in the museum in the form of a painting and decided that I wanted to address it in the form of sculpture. And so what we did was we took a map, a digital map of the existing 17th century canal house, reflected it onto a wave algorithm, produced a 3D model, output it using CNC technology, and replaced the, the distorted image of the building in three dimensions on the existing building. I know that that sounds complicated, and, and it is. <laughs> the one thing that we couldn't do digitally was color the piece. So the entire facade, 40 feet of that building, is hand painted. This is a project that I did nearby Cleveland, Ohio, um, for the gentle wind doth move silently and visibly. It's a, a William Blake poem. This is the Mall B in downtown Cleveland, and, and it's a Daniel Burnham master plan that wasn't ever completed. The train station wasn't built, and as a result, this particular corridor is known for the high winds that whip through it. And so I decided to restore some of the, the garden furniture that Burnham never was able to realize. We placed it in a virtual wind tunnel and distorted them virtually, output them in CNC milling technologies, and restore them to the plaza, windswept as they now are. Again, a temporary art project. Now, Percent for Art is something that you've all heard about. Um, it basically programs, local programs, um, where uh, capital projects require a certain percentage of money allocated toward a public art project. It's been very, very successful in different parts of the country. And so the, the typical rule of thumb is 1%. In these economic times, it's, it's being shaved down to more like a half a percent uh, of art projects that are, that are built in, in, in uh, conjunction with major projects. Um, this is a project that I did uh, in Los Cerritos, California, East Los Angeles. It's called Remembering Walter Dubner. Walter Dubner invented the shopping bag. 
So it's a memorial to a, a hero, an unsung hero <laughs> in American history. And the idea was to pro provide a gateway for this, this commercial space, but also the idea that the, the consumer as they pass into the space is actually being consumed on their way in and out. <laughs> um, again, it was a piece that wanted to have a sort of monumental presence in the space. It's also illuminated. It has a complete spectrum LED lighting, so it can be lit uh, uh, for different occasions in different ways. This is a proposal uh, that's going to be, I hope, we're five years in the making, uh, at the entrance to the Manhattan Bridge on Flatbush Avenue uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, at one point in time, there was a very grand entrance to the Manhattan Bridge, and Miss Brooklyn and Miss Manhattan, originally designed by Daniel Chester French, who designed the Lincoln Memorial, flanked either side of this gateway. Well, Robert Moses proposed a cross Manhattan Expressway uh, that would have destroyed what we now celebrate as Soho. He managed to demolish the Brooklyn side of the Manhattan Bridge, but didn't get as far as the Manhattan side. So that side of the bridge is still intact. Anyway, I decided in this new way of thinking about civic spaces, public spaces, art is something that's seen as having value. So whereas Moses saw it as an obstacle to progress, the way that city planners are thinking now is that art actually is uh, a destination, is something that uh, enriches people's lives. And so Miss Manhattan and Miss Brooklyn have been recreated now in fiberglass. And unlike their original presentation, which was rather stoic and far apart, they now dance over Manhattan, uh, over the uh, Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn and Manhattan rotating around each other in a perpetual dance. And they too are illuminated at night. This is a, a project called Simnai Didro, which means twisted chimney in Welsh. Um, this is um, in a rural countryside near Caerphilly. Um, it's a part of uh, Wales that the government is trying to rebrand as a, as a green tourist economy. Um, if you had seen a, a painting of this region from the 19th or 18th century, it would have been a forest of smokestacks. And the government has been systematically removing these vestiges of the industrial age. And I see it as being a sort of sad, the idea of eliminating history rather than reckoning with it doesn't seem to me to be the most appropriate way of dealing with it. And so I decided, let's think about these chimneys. Let's, let's represent them in a way that is modern and makes sense to us. And so I virtually twisted an, an 18th century smokestack, forced it into the ground as we do with carbon emissions today, and it rears its head <laughs> down the hill further. And so we have this commentary on, on the industrial age and the way that we're t attempting to address these issues in the present time. Also completely synthetic. Um, this is a project called Stronghold. It's uh, on the campus of the University of Washington. Um, a very beautiful, picturesque, bucolic landscape. Um, it was once an old growth forest. The forest was clear cut to make way for the, the university. And I thought it was a shame that there was nothing left of the scale of these great trees that once stood there. And so I restored a 26-foot tree stump made from western red cedar, which is the most common byproduct of that tree. And so there's 10,000 linear feet of 2 by 6 that we pegged and glued together to reconstitute that form. It's modeled after the largest western red cedar still living in the peninsula. It can be entered from behind. It has seating with inside of it. It has an unobstructed view of Lake Union. Public commissions. So these are commissions that um, cities uh, enlist artists to participate in. They tend to be permanent in nature. This is a project called Tempest. Um, it was commissioned by South Beach, Miami. It is the spiraling form of a hurricane. Um, it's made by using um, wave algorithms that were developed for cinema, like The Perfect Storm. My studio figured out how to translate these two-dimensional illusions into three-dimensional models. And so these are actual waves that have been uh, cut in styrofoam, cast in fiberglass, and installed within this aluminum framework. It's about 40 feet in diameter, and it's large enough for people to traverse the maze. It, too, illuminates at night. Now, the largest project that I've ever been asked to do uh, is a project called the Irish Hunger Memorial. It's down in Battery Park City. Um, it's a half an acre sculpture um, 
devoted to remembering those who perished in the Irish famine of 1847-52. Um, it was also designed to raise awareness of world hunger today. Many of these memorials, uh, famine memorials, depict emaciated images of women and children starving, and it seemed to me uh, that that wasn't an appropriate gesture for me. Um, instead, I decided that famine really is about the politics of land and land use. Who has access to it? Who controls it? Who owns it? And so to objectify this quarter acre plot, fallow plot, positioned directly across the New York Mercantile Exchange, I think has a kind of political power resonance. We imported an actual famine era house from Ireland and reconstructed it on the site. Uh, the base of the memorial has two miles of text, all of which can be changed over time. Nothing is permanently inscribed. And so as famine continues to progress as, a, as part of the human condition, we can reflect where it's happening, how it's happening, and what the consequences are. The text is simply cast a shadow from behind. And that's what the memorial looks like from the riverside. Now, uh, this particular, this project, just to put things in perspective, I won this competition in, in the year 2000. It was a design build, one year. There's one million pounds of concrete in this project. If the World Trade Center hadn't fallen on this project in construction, we would have been done within that one year time period. But we still managed to complete it six months later. Okay, <laughs> here's, here's what we've all been waiting for. <laughs> and I hope, I, I, I'm always concerned about going through time and I, I end up speaking much more quickly than I need to. Um, so I, as I understand it, a group of artists was reviewed based on their qualifications, which is a very common way of selecting an artist. There, there, of course, there are RFQs and RFPs, and in this case, it was, it was an RFQ. And it, from what I understand, it was a, a pretty competitive team of artists who were finally uh, selected. Um, some of you may have read in the newspaper um, <laughs> that there is a connection between um, my family and the American Electric Power Company. And what's important to know is that my dad is a, is a mechanical engineer and he's keenly interested. I, I, I first started my life as a politician. I, I went to school for political science and I came home to my father one day and I said, Dad, I'm not going to law school. I want to be an artist. And he said, thank God, I hate lawyers. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of guy my dad is. So he's always very interested in what it is that I'm doing. So I mentioned that I was in Columbus and I was up for a project and he said, I, I worked in Columbus for a while and uh, I worked for this American Electric Power Company and I was designing uh, hyperboloid towers. Now in that particular application they were used for cooling towers and what m many people don't understand about this technology and the significance of it happening here in Columbus with AEP is that these were the first non-mechanical cooling t towers employed in the power industry. These are green technologies. These are self-drafting, self-cooling towers. There's no mechanical fans involved. So what we've come to associate as a negative thing with nuclear energy is in fact a very, very green technology that's been used uh, very successfully in many kinds of power plants. That said, my father mentioning that fact was the equivalent of him handing me a novel that I had never read before. You know, check this out. And I did, and so from that very personal conversation with my dad, I began to delve into what is the hyperbolic tower? You know, what is it? Well, it's a very old technology. It goes back to the 19th century. And it was a brilliant innovation. In fact, it's still being employed today. This is the lightest weight, most economic way of achieving height and scale. And it was relevant in 1896, and it's just as relevant as it is today. So this is an observation tower from the, from the 1890s. One of the things that the people that I met with Columbus and all of the visits that I made here was that they wanted to anchor themselves in the history of the place, but they wanted to be forward looking. They wanted to suggest progress and, and a vision into the future. And this hyperbolic tower spoke that to me because it is grounded in this history, but it succeeds because of its innovation. It succeeds because of its flexibility, because of its economy. 
a lighthouse made using this very same technology. I mean, I can't think of anything more beautiful than that. A radio tower built using this technology. A modern skyscraper used this technology. Now you've seen, one of the things that you should understand about artists who work in public realm is that we're having to, we one, come up with a conceptual phase, right? So this is the idea phase. The idea phase then has to be met by a design phase. And the design phase is, is still part of the creative process. We have to go from cooking up something in our mind's eye to making it happen. That means engineering, that means all sorts of designers need to be involved. And the reality of those, those things can continue to inform the design of the work. And so in my case, the image that you all saw uh, on the dispatch, I'm assuming, um, <laughs> Uh, was an earlier iteration of this design which has progressed a great deal since that first presentation. Oh, not the least of which. Um, people, there are scientists who believe that it's a hyperboid form that is our universe. So this model is far more profound than a sculpture or a radio tower. Okay, so the title. Now this is a Columbus connection. One of my dearest friends is a man named Steve Parks. He was, his family is, goes back to the bushes. In fact, they're buried right next to each other. And he became a curator at the Beinecke Library at Yale in books and manuscripts. And whenever, I have, whenever I'm stumped for a title, Steve gets a phone call. And so I called Steve up and I said, I'm working on this project in Columbus. I need a title. He said, I'll get on it. And he came back with Joel Barlow's epic poem, The Columbiad, originally titled Vision of Columbus. Now this was an epic poem that was written about migration across the North American continent. And it's an epic poem that is all about the optimism, the future of this place, and ultimately the future of this country. It seemed to me a very appropriate title for a work positioned here. It's also a coincidence that the man died in 1812, which is when your place was founded, and they're about to celebrate the bicentennial of. Coincidences. So, Here's my most recent vision for the Columbiad. It is a 75 foot tall hyperboloid tower. It is incorporating this very ingenious design to create a work that I think does what the, the people who invited me here in the first place asked me to do. It creates a landmark, it creates an iconic image, and it creates a gathering place on the mile. It's about 75 feet tall, made of stainless steel. This is a view of the tower from the promenade. A closer view. Now there's a key difference between this work and the work that you saw in the dispatch. I've reduced the amount of steel considerably making the work that much more economic and, in my opinion, that much more elegant. It'll be far more uh, simple to build and I just find the lines of it very, very appealing. I've changed the way that the piece meets the ground. It, it contacts the ground directly and I've opened up the top to create this kind of crenellation or crown effect. Um, I've removed all the glass from the project. Uh, which has saved a considerable amount of money, but it also solves some of the concerns that the community has had, those, those concerns being migratory birds, uh, reflection, and, and, and things of that nature. But having done so, I think I've created a far more open structure. And what we decided to do was to replace that green, I mean, that, that mirrored glass enclosure with a second uh, interior framework that supports organic material. So we're, we're planning on creating an inner vertical garden within the space of the tower. And we haven't decided which plants we're going to use, but we're thinking about either a Virginia creeper, which is a native. Um, it's a, a plant that's deciduous. It's beautiful light green in the spring. You probably all know it. It grows very well out here, as I understand. And it turns bright red in the fall. So it will, it will change with the seasons as well. Um, it's also a plant that grows berries that attracts birds. And so this is habitat for the, uh, the natural world here in Columbus. Now at night, 
the structure of the project is celebrated. So one of the things that was discussed was the idea that this project would be a beacon on the skyline of Columbus. Now you have a lot of very tall buildings and it was important that we created something of a scale that could stand up to the surrounding buildings and punctuate that prow. So if you think about that hyperboloid lighthouse that I showed you, if you think about this prow projecting into the, into the river and now you have this incredible beacon standing there on the prow, it's illuminated using LED technology, which is very, very low voltage technology. And what it also allows for us to do is to create a full spectrum of color. So the piece can be changed uh, at different times of the year uh, to celebrate different events. In the same way, perhaps, that the Empire State Building changes colors in New York City to celebrate different moments. <laughs> This is a view from, uh, I think that's a view from your office, Ron. <laughs> so this gives you a sense of, the, of scale at a distance. A few other details. This, this gives you a sense of what the scale is. The base of the piece is 57 feet in diameter. The, the, the top of the piece is 36 feet in diameter. The other thing to keep in mind, I mean, there is a, a play on this idea of a cooling tower. Because this is now a green space, it's a vertical space, it's a garden space, it will create a natural shaded environment for people to sit and take shelter from the sun in the hot summer's days. Also, the transference that happens with plants, the transfer of moisture, will also create an additional cooling effect. So I think it will be a place that people will want to gather, will want to take refuge from the sun, and will provide an unobstructed view of the river and the surrounding areas, considering that the entry points are, are something in the order of 20 feet. And so the uh, opening points are far above anybody's eye level. And so because this piece is so efficient and so effectively designed, it only touches ground at 10 points. And so 10 points over 57 feet isn't very much at all. I think that concludes my presentation. And leaves time for questions from the audience, and uh, we've got a, enough professionals here today that we might have some questions. Um, CMC records all its forms. I want to warn you about that in advance, and the broadcast on ONN. That's not to discourage anyone. Um, there's, they're also streaming on the CMC website and the Columbus Metropolitan Library website. If you have questions, please come to the microphone, where George is now, introduce yourself and ask your question, um, and we thank you for not making long editorial comments. Thank you. George O'Donnell, two compliments and then a question. And that is, the Columbiad will be a great foot end, or book end, if you will, to the Scioto Mile with the North Bank Pavilion, and this being at the south end. And, and congratulations and good luck with it. Thank you. The Hunger Memorial in New York City that you also designed is with unbelievable sensitivity. And I, I have to compliment you on that, Brian. And I guess the question might be, uh, who will have control of dialogue, uh, of the two miles of dialogue that we have within the memorial in the future? Well, uh, that's, that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your kind remarks. Um, that was the most uh, anxiety-provoking aspect of the memorial. Uh, it was required that I provide historic inscription. And I'm an artist who makes work about history. I, I didn't want to be the person who, who uh, set the history in stone. Uh, so it created a tremendous amount of anxiety. And so I re uh, recruited historians uh, and many other people, uh, writers, uh, to provide us with text. The text is, in, the text is presented in the memorial. Uh, in, uh, it's not in a chronological order. Um, and it's not in a categorical order. So the idea for me was this is a cacophony of information that can come from many sources, and as the viewer approaches the memorial, will encounter different thoughts, stories, sentiments about these statistics about. I mean, one of the things that's on the memorial is, is the, the stati uh, statistic uh, for the amount of dog food that's consumed in the United States, for example. Uh, so we have put together an executive committee who every year reviews the text and we present two new t pieces of information every single year. The other thing that you should know is that there's an audio component to the memorial uh, in the passageway. Uh, and that audio uh, 
is maintained by the World Food Organization. And so they can add updated information about hunger in different parts of the world. And we can also tie into, say, UN conferences about hunger. So there's some real-time capability there. Um, so what was something that made me very, very anxious ended up, I think, resulting in a, in a fairly dynamic um, memorial. Yes. Hi, I'm Bill Lafayette, and I've got uh, what's probably a leading question. I'm an economist who happens to believe that uh, this kind of work is extremely important. So I'd like you to give us your argument about why we should be spending more money on public art. Uh, well, I, I th thank you for that question. I, <laughs> you know, art's one of those things, we don't need it, right? I mean, we don't need it to the extent that it doesn't shelter us, it doesn't feed us, it doesn't clothe us. There's no practical reason for it. But it's, the arts in general are us. The arts in general are the things that, de that define us as a species. And it's a thing that can nourish us on so many levels. And I think the one, I mean, the greatest compliment that I ever received uh, from Verlin Klinkenborg, who wrote an editorial piece in the New York Times, he basically said, great art or great public art trusts the intelligence of the community that it serves. And I think that that said, that if you put a great piece of art into a community, if you put something that has had a tremendous amount of thought and effort made, people respond. I've never had a work in a public space tagged, for example. I've never had a work of public art vandalized in all the cities in the world that I've worked because people take ownership. They feel a sense of civic pride if their communities come together to make something extraordinary that is a work of art that doesn't need to exist, but it has to exist. Hi, I'm Rick Livingston from Ohio State University. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you. Um, You've really opened my mind uh, to this. I, I had a, a negative reaction looking at the dispatch, and I feel much more positive today. <laughs> I'm glad for that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my question really picks up on, on the last thing you said, and, and um, in terms of trusting the intelligence of, of the community, I guess I'm, I'm wondering what, what, what would be a good dialogue to be having about public art, and particularly about the idea of progress? Um, in this um, particular context. Uh, the Columbiad is very forward-looking, um, but that has, um, you know, there's certainly a contested history about that that has come up um, oh, sure. since then. Sure. So, um, you know, what should we be uh, conversing about in, and what is our conception of progress uh, that, that uh, this is going to evoke? Thanks. So you're referring specifically to the poem. To yeah, the Columbia, the yeah. Well, I think we, it's very difficult to, to it's, well, actually, history is a sitting duck, right? <laughs> so it's very, very easy to judge history after the fact. And I think that the people who are in this room are the descendants of immigrants who came here from someplace else. And we also know that there were people that were displaced during that period of time. But I think that, that this is all part and parcel of, of, of the human experience and human nature. I think the poem is an optimistic poem. I think the poem is, is about promise. Um, we, we can also go back and look at uh, sculptures like Mount Rushmore, one of the most celebrated works uh, in, in America, a very patriotic image. There are people who would see that as, 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 as the decimation of a sacred space, a native space. And so these, in a world that has evolved in the way that ours has, these kinds of conflicts, these kinds of injustices are inevitable. And we continue to inflict and perpetuate these things as we move around the globe, which is the nature of the human experience. I'm not apologizing for what, what happened, but I'm also willing to say that history is something that's continuing to unfold before us, and we need to obsess it, uh, assess it uh, as it's revealed. So, I think the poem is a beautiful poem uh, in many aspects, but I also recognize uh, the fact that it has, it's part of a, a colonial history. Uh. Uh, yes, sir, my name is John McKnight, and uh, in the course of my work, 
Um, I do a, a small amount of design work, um, which comes from my own, you know, whatever, artistic inspiration, I guess. So I'll, I'll put together something, and then when I get it to where I like it, I'll take it and I'll show the receptionist or somebody else that I work with and get their opinions on it. They offer their opinions about what I should change, uh, at which point uh, I immediately get, you know, a little ticked off and defensive because <laughs> it was how I wanted it. Um, how difficult is it for you on a, on a such a large scale, the pieces that you do, when you get a community that says, you know, we like what you've got, but we need it to be cheaper or we need to, you know, do away with the glass because of the birds or whatever. Uh, you know, a construction company is one thing, an artist, it seems like, you know, that's, that's got to be difficult. It's, it's not as difficult as you might Thank think. You. Thank you. Um, if you accept that, if you accept the challenge of being an artist who works in public spaces, that, that these, this is a very, very complex landscape. And you have to embrace the fact that you're going to have to deal with community, you're going to have to deal with governments, you're going to have to deal with fundraising. These are all part and parcel. When you sign, that, sign on to that job, this is something that you have to assume. And I don't feel like the changes that I made to the Columbia are compromises. I think that they're informed decisions. And, and we can't make those informed decisions until we put something out into the world and get a response. So removing the glass, although it was at first a difficult thing for me to do, once I realized what potential opened up by making that move, it expanded my understanding of the project rather than limited it. So um, I think compromise is, is an essential part of, of making art in public places. And I think that every project that I've made has benefited from that, from compromise, without compromising quality, because I don't think that what we've got here today is any less, I think it's actually far more interesting to me and far more beautiful to me, having gone through this process. My name is Mary Pat Martin, and uh, in your remarks today, and I also got to hear you talk to Ann Fisher this morning, and I was really excited about the relationship you, you uh, imagine between civic space and history, and especially the discussion of the Twisted Chimney Project. And I would just like to know more about what you set out to learn about Columbus, and you know how you approach that as a project, and then how that affected the development of the design that we see sure. now. Sure, thank you. Um, well, let me start by saying that th there, there's little or no difference between work that I produce in my studio that's generated by my own interest and work that I produce in the public sphere. It starts the same way. It starts with research. It starts with intensive research. And in the case of a city, that research may be in the historical society, which I visited several times. It may be at the museum. It may be at the, the science center. It may be by having a dinner with friends who know something about the history of a city. There are many, many variables that go into informing a project. And I think that what I was responding to uh, most directly was the fact that so many of the people that I met with here were really craving something that pointed to a new way of thinking about things, a new way of creating form, a new way of defining a public space. So it wasn't appropriate here, for example, to make a work that referenced a specific aspect of Columbus history, although I know it pretty well <laughs> at this point. Um, and so once I found, by happenstance, this particular form, it seemed to me that it because it had been used in so many interesting applications like lighthouses, because it continues to be used as a cutting edge technology that will certainly endure into the future, especially if our universe looks like this. <laughs> um, it seemed to me that this was potentially a very, very forward looking uh, project, but it also achieved the scale and the scope that I, I felt the community wanted, and it did it in what I believe to be the most economic way. Any other questions? Well, I just want to comment on uh, how wonderful it is to sort of justify our existence because this organization is all about community conversation and dialogue. So thank you, Brian. I um, also want to uh, just to, uh, it, it's amazing, uh, you have a political science background, as do I, but I went to law school. The <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not too late to change. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the other issue is yesterday we had a, a billionaire venture capitalist who was a history major 
and Mark Kwame, uh, who works with the governor in job creation, who was a French major. So uh, anybody out there supporting liberal arts, you ought to congratulate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we want to continue the conversation uh, out in the lobby. There are, there are some cookies and coffee, uh, and I want to also remind you to join us tomorrow evening uh, for the, uh, at the Columbus Museum of Art for the Jingle Mingle. Um, it will be a great party to celebrate the holidays uh, and uh, our successful uh, 2011 for CMC. Once more, I want to thank our sponsor for today, Smith & Hale, uh, and the Downtown Commission for their award presentation, and in particular, our very articulate speaker, Brian Toll, Thank and very talented. Much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the afternoon. <laughs>